All right, and we are recording. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. This is the third session of the Bad Buildings webinar series. My name is Kelsey Romer. I am a, uh, an AmeriCorps member with the Preservation Alliance of West Virginia, and the site where I do my service is the Northern West Virginia Brownfields Assistance Center uh, and their Bad Buildings program at WVU. So we've got uh, a few people that I get to work with pretty often here with us today, which I'm very excited for. We've got Danielle Parker, who is the director of PAWV. We've got Mr. Mike Giolis, who is a historic preservation consultant. And I think just about anybody that does uh, preservation in West Virginia probably knows his name. Uh, and then we've got Susan Pierce, who is the deputy state historic preservation officer uh, here in West Virginia. So we're going to hear uh, about historic preservation and how that can be a tool for brownfields. Uh, so we're going to have a lot of information about some state historic tax credits, um, how to get your uh, project funded, why historic preservation is a good idea in general, and all these sorts of uh, really great ideas. So uh, in the meantime, uh, while they're speaking, you can go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat, uh, drop any questions that you have in there. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties or anything of that nature, you can go ahead and email myself or Nicole Diaz, who is also uh, at the Bad Buildings Program. I'll drop our emails in the chat so you'll have those as well. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to them. So I believe, uh, Danielle, are you, uh, you going to be first up? Excellent. Okay, give me one second here to share my screen, and then we will be good to go. Thanks, everybody. Sorry, just give me one second here. I, whenever this popped up as the presentation, it took all of my other stuff away. So I thought I was already here. You are okay. No okay. worries. Very <laughs> okay, great. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. My name is Danielle Parker, and I am the executive director of the Preservation Alliance of West Virginia which is the grassroots statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving our mountain state's unique cultural heritage for current and future generations. I'm here today to talk about how historic preservation intersects with Brownfield redevelopment. Brownfield's projects carry the spirit of rebirth, using, uniting environmental protection, economic development, and community revitalization. West Virginia has many old buildings and industrial complexes that are primed for this rebirth, so to say. But rehabilitating these properties can be challenging because of the inherent complexity of dealing with environmental contaminants. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to share some ideas about how historic preservation can be used as a tool for redeveloping brownfield sites in hopes that it will help you with one of your projects. So I'm gonna stop my video just to make sure I don't get any delay in my voice. So in my experience, when people talk to me about brownfields, uh, next slide, please. I think there is a big focus on dilapidated buildings, the eyesores and the life safety hazards. Back in 2016, West Virginia University's Land Use and Law Clinic published a legal toolkit for dealing with dilapidated buildings. In the report, the law clinic stated that one in 16 properties in West Virginia were vacant and dilapidated. In my work with PEWV, I've spent a lot of time helping people realize that demolition is not the only answer for their vacant and dilapidated buildings. These places are unique opportunities for community engagement, downtown revitalization, and much more for our rural communities. In the Law Clinic's legal guide, they cited how historic preservation can be a tool for dealing with these properties. So I think we can start today by defining historic preservation for those who um, maybe have never heard this term before. Historic preservation is generally defined as the process of identifying, protecting, and enhancing buildings, places, and objects of historical and cultural significance. This process embraces many phases, including the survey and evaluation of historical, architectural, and cultural resources in an area the development of planning and legal measures to protect these resources, 
and the identification of public and private funding sources applicable to preservation projects, um, as well as adaptive reuse of historic structures and the ongoing maintenance. So historic preservation is also a conversation about our past and our future. The idea of preserving our historic buildings and environments is such an important part of our state and nation that there are various levels of government support and financial incentives available to rehabilitate and repurpose our historic buildings. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about like how the government works with the public or, or uh, private developers, but I think it's valuable to understand that there is support through the local, state, and federal government agencies, as well as state, local, and national nonprofits. So you'll get to meet some of us today who are those people who provide support. Uh, next slide. So the next question I have for you is if you know whether your building is historic. You're convinced that you want to preserve it, the building, or let's say an old warehouse, and you have a great idea for its redevelopment. The next thing you can do is determine if your building is certified as historic. A building is identified as a certified historic structure if it is on the National Register of Historic Places, which is the official list of the nation's historic places worthy of preservation. It's authorized by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, so it's been around for oh, quite a while, and the West Virginia State Historic Preservation Office, so that is Susan, where Susan Pierce works, and she'll talk more about their inner workings and the things that they can offer, but that's who works with the National Park Service to determine which buildings are added to the National Register. Buildings are listed for at least one of four reasons, so I listed those on the screen. Um, I'm not going to go through those, but know that those are the, that's the criteria. And the buildings can be listed individually on the National Register or in a group, which is known as a historic district. So in a historic dis district, the buildings are generally located near each other and within a defined boundary. And they all represent one of the four criteria that are on the screen. Within the boundary of the historic district, your building is known as either a contributing structure or a non-contributing structure. Um, this is important for many of our projects that work with brownfields in downtowns because you want that contributing structure status for your building because then it is eligible for more financial incentives. So contributing is great. Non-contributing, um, again, you just don't have as much um, opportunities for the financial incentives that we'll discuss a little bit later on. Um, it is worth noting about the National Register of Historic Places. There are a lot of misconceptions about what that means. And if your building is listed, whether individually or as a contributing structure in a historic district, there are no restrictions automatically by that National Register listing. Um, the restrictions come into place when you use federal funding or federal licensings or permits, and then also um, if you use historic tax credits, other situations where there may be restrictions is if you have a local ordinance in place. So those are things that, again, you could reach out to the local government and then the state government to get some support in identifying w whether or not you do. And then also, um, I take calls sometimes about some of these questions. And for the ones, I can sometimes, you know, hunt things down for you all if you're looking for things that are already listed. Um, and then again, you can visit the West Virginia State Historic Preservation Office's website. They have a map that lists properties that have been surveyed, and then they also have all the National Register listings. So you can like go through ones for your district to see the buildings that are contributing or non-contributing. Next slide. So what makes a historic building a brownfield? In many cases, a historic building can be designated as a brownfield because it is contaminated with hazardous materials. When rehabilitating a historic building that is also a brownfield, you will likely run into environmental contaminants that need to be cleaned up. These may include lead-based paint, asbestos, petroleum, controlled substances, um, meth labs, things like that that um, you know have those like drug related things and then mine scarred lands. 
also animal debris because if you've ever been in an old building and the ceiling's falling down or the windows are out, there's likely piles of bird, birds or bats or poo and that's actually an environmental condition that can be addressed. So generally speaking, also you'll find that the most common contaminants you'll face in your historic building are lead-based paint and asbestos in my experience. A certified historic structure has to have been built at least 50 years ago. So for that national register listing, it needs to be 50 years old. So any building before 1971 could be built before 1971 could be considered historic now. It wasn't until 1978 that the US banned the use of lead-based paint. So you can do the math here and see that most historic buildings will have lead-based paint unless they have been already properly been properly remediated which you may find in old school buildings. The US um, has highly regulated asbestos, so I don't think you'll see that used too often, except for in things, I, what I read online is things like um, materials for trucks and like rubber. So it shouldn't be used in buildings anymore, um, but the people at the Brownfields would know more about that than me. Uh, I'm just trying to point out the, where some of these things overlap, which meaning it is when you're dealing with a historic building, you're going to deal with some hazardous materials. And so one thing I wanted to point out was that the op these obstacles are obstacles to redeveloping a building um, because you're dealing with life safety issues. But even if you demolish the building, you're still disturbing these hazardous materials. So you still have to, depending on the level of asbestos or lead paste paint, you're still going to have to remediate before you can demolish it because you can't have these materials going airborne or leaking into the water systems. So just because your building has asbestos doesn't mean you need to tear it down. And that happens in a lot of historic buildings. And as soon as people hear that word, it's like they get scared. And so I wanted to touch on that because I've had a lot of conversations with people over the years about it. Um, and then of course, there is funding available to encourage the rehabilitation of brownfields. So to deal with these environmental contaminants and then plan. I'm not gonna talk about that today because that's not my area of expertise. Um, but of course, that's why we're here with the Brownfield Center. Um, they are able to discuss those things with you. So next slide. Um, I wanted to try to convince you some more to save your historic buildings. Um, so I've put in some fun facts in the next couple slides about why you should save your building. If from an economical viewpoint, Rehabilitating a historic building makes more money for the municipality and state. Towns and cities that encourage the reuse of their historic downtowns and neighborhoods generally attract tourists, new residents, and new businesses. There is a concept in economics called revealed preference. Consumers reveal their preference not by answering a poll, but through their economic decisions. In cities large and small, consumers have revealed their preference for living, shopping, visiting, and locating their businesses in historic neighborhoods. That, that built history in your community is not nostalgia, it is an economic asset. So some of this information um, has been taken from the US Chamber of Commerce website. And then there is an, a company that has grown a lot over the years called Place Economics, and they've done a lot of studies about how historic preservation works in different cities um, all over the country. So this, a lot of the data that we have here is national, and um, we do have some data from the West Virginia State Historic Preservation Office about like their programs and what kind of the numbers of jobs and things that they're creating. But just some good statistics here when you're looking at labor income. Um, and then, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, <coughs> another economic benefit of historic preservation is that it encourages small businesses. Older buildings have more affordable rents than new buildings, which have to recoup the cost of their construction. Small businesses have to keep costs as low as possible, especially rent, to focus on their actual product. Another interesting fact from the a place economic study is that small businesses, which are fewer than 50 employees, account for 96% of all employees in the US. Therefore, we should be maintaining our older buildings to help small businesses, which in turn employ most of our workforce. 
So a lot of this data, of course, is um, from pre-COVID-19, and we all know some of the effects there. But I think, you know, we're as we get through things and we're able to get back to the things we were working on before, you'll see these numbers come back into play. So next slide, please. So I know that a lot of people are also dealing with um, neighborhoods, not just like commercial districts, but there is a lot of dilapidated housing. So I have a couple comments on here about, about housing, um, because in my opinion, it's important to keep your historic neighborhoods as well. Um, and neighborhoods can be certified as historic on the National Register of Historic Places on their own. Um, like there's the Weiss neighborhood, Weiss Historic District in Elkins is an example. Um, there are several examples in Charleston that are just coming to the top of my head. There's some in Huntington um, and in Martinsburg. So our cities in West Virginia have neighborhoods that have been identified as historic and are therefore eligible for some of the incentives that we'll be talking about today. And I've put together a list here of some things, some research, um, and compiled it here for you of reasons to preserve your historic homes and neighborhoods. So older buildings play an important and often overlooked role in housing affordability across the country. Housing preservation is typically cheaper and faster than constructing new, new units and effectively combats blight. The most affordable house is already standing and was built more than 50 years ago. It is impossible to build a house for less than $130,000 today without heavy subsidies. And one of the most, so number two, one of the most important impacts historic preservation has on a community is providing affordable and varied housing options. Older and historic neighborhoods offer a diverse housing stock at varying prices, sizes, and conditions and are located in close proximity to transit and jobs. Older neighborhoods are homes to what has been labeled middle miss missing middle housing, like duplexes, triplexes, small scale apartments. We struggle to get developers to build these units uh, today and even getting established neighborhoods to accept them. So a third reason, while the condition, condition of older housing is regularly cited as a concern, the number of properties needing significant repairs is low. According to the 2017 American Housing Survey, only 2% of pre-1960 housing is severely inadequate and only 6% is moderately inadequate. And um, a final thought there on neighborhoods and preserving houses is across the nation, housing costs per month for older housing are simply less. Also, according to the American Housing Survey, nationally, nearly a third of housing units were built prior to 1960, and this older housing is home to 33% of households and incomes less than $40,000. So below the medium level income for West Virginia, uh, just, just below it. Um, and for those of you who may not know this, uh, West Virginia has a historic residential tax credit. So for these properties, and they're of all different sizes, and um, shapes, they are eligible for this rehabilitation investment tax credit. Um, this provides a West Virginia state income tax for the rehabilitation of historic private residences. It's a 20% state income tax credit for any qualified expenditures undertaken as part of the rehabilitation of your private residence. So encouraging people to buy their own homes, you know, in, in Charleston, in Wheeling, um, in just various places around the state. Um, and then, of course, if you are maybe going to buy them up and rent them out as a commercial enterprise, you know, you could use it as a the commercial tax credit, which uh, Susan will talk about today. But her office also does the historic homeowner tax credit. And I wanted to mention that today because I don't think, um, you know, I don't think people realize that their homes are in historic districts and that when they're making updates, they could earn these tax credits. So next slide, please. So more thoughts on affordable housing. One second, please. I have kids and they're so loud. <laughs> no worries at all. <laughs> I think we are all used to the Zoom situation. <laughs> I'm just gonna mention it again. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, go ahead and drop them in the chat, but thank you. 
Yeah, they were just getting so loud. I felt like I was screaming and I'm like, there's no way you guys can't hear them. So, okay, we're on the next slide here. More conversations about affordable housing. Um, so we look to create healthy lifestyles. A lot of us are in the community development field. I've recognized a lot of your names um, from working with you in the past. And we all want to increase jobs and incomes. And we want to efficiently use our infrastructure, grow our economy, create a positive city image, supply quality affordable housing, and work towards a sustainable future. There is not a single new neighborhood that can meet all of these goals, even if it meets nearly every goal, an existing older neighborhood will always beat the new one when it comes to efficient infrastructure and sustainability because new water or sewer lines are not needed in an existing neighborhood. And the buildings are already there, so no new materials need to be used to build the neighborhood. It makes sense to invest in our existing historic downtowns and residential neighborhoods, and it is cost effective to do so. When affordable housing or another specific need is clear in an area and historic buildings are available to re meet it, the rehabilitation of an abandoned school, library, hotel, this one on the example on the screen is a department store. So you're solving two problems, what to do with an abandoned building that may be a magnet for vandalism or you know, squatting, whatever, oh, we know all the problems associated with vacant buildings and that of where to find affordable housing space. Um, the same could be true for turning an old hotel or school into office space or an industrial building into a mall or theater complex. Um, in the cases of affordable housing, another financial incentive is the low income housing tax credit that provides a tax incentive to construct or rehabilitate affordable rental housing. Um, so this, this housing tax credit can be paired with the commercial rehabilitation tax credit that we'll go over later on. Um, now, I'm not an expert in any of these, but I do want to mention them and because as it pertains to a lot of the projects that we talk about over the years. Um, so next slide, please. And so the low income housing tax credit um, is from the federal government. It issues tax credits to state and territorial governments and then state housing agencies award the credits to private developers of the affordable renting, rental housing projects. It's a competitive process. The developers usually sell the credits to private investors to obtain funding. Once the housing project is placed in service, investors can claim the tax credit over a 10 year period. The annual credit claimed by a taxpayer equals a credit percentage multiplied by the product project's qualified basis. So the example here on the screen is a project done by Woodlands Development Group, um, and they also have a um, branch called Woodlands Community Lenders, which is a certified community development financial institution. If you live in the counties of Barber, Randolph, or Tucker, you should look them up if you think that they may be able to help you with a project. Um, next slide, please. So another incentive is the new market tax credit, which is, it is kind of a complicated thing. Um, there are people who spend entire weeks on this concept and what these tax credits are but I wanted to give you guys some resources in case you wanted to see if your project is in a qualifying area, which is like the yellow on this map. And you can type in your address into the website um, that I put at the top to see if your address qualifies, like if your building qualifies for the new market tax credit. And if you see that it does, then you can go to the last link, which has the CDFIs to see who receives these tax credit allocations and then you could partner with as a lender because how it works is that the new investors provide capital to community development entities cdes and in exchange are awarded credits against their federal tax obligations investors can claim their allotted tax credits in as little as seven years um, five percent of the investment for each of the first three years and six percent of the project for the remaining four years for a total of 39 percent of the new market tax credit project see it's very complicated but there are people available to help so um, some of the concentrated areas on the map for those of you who aren't that familiar i kind of zoomed in and found which it was and they are oak hill charleston madison charlestown and kingwood 
Um, and then again, please visit those links to learn more. And um, I have two more slides. This one is about, sorry, next slide, funding source, extra funding sources. So you have a historic building that is maybe, um, you, depending on what you wanna do with it, maybe it's cultural heritage tourism, maybe it's for education purposes, but there are all these other grants from the National Trust for Historic Preservation and then the National Park Service that you could be eligible for because maybe of the history of your building. So um, African-American culture and the civil rights grants are, have a lot of funding going to them right now, and those can be used for capital projects. Um, and then some of the other ones like the Hart Family Fund and the Henry A. Jordan Fund can be used for planning purposes. Um, and then these have a range I would just go ahead and click save those links. Um, I did I did have a lot of information in here, but I'm running low on my allotted time. So I would just click the links and check out what we have available there. Uh, next slide is, I just, um, sorry, these, this is my last two slides. This is a comment on how roadside architecture can qualify for historic preservation. Like, brownfields, you're dealing with petroleum. And yeah, we can send the links in an email. Um, we can, when you're dealing with some kind of environmental contaminants in an old gas station that's not being used anymore, there are a lot of situations where these have been rehabilitated for new purposes. There's one in Fayetteville, sometimes for the same purposes too. Um, and there is funding available usually every year, but um, it's from the Department of Transportation. It's like transportation alternatives. It has a new, it has a recently new name um, that I just popped into my mind. I forgot to look it up for this, but we'll send it out with the links. And that can be used for rehabilitation of transportation type of buildings. So also like railroad stations or other ones, uh, depots. Um, yeah, so we'll send some more information by email. And then PAWV, next slide, um, offers, we have a Saving Historical Places grant that's used for emergency stabilization and for d planning purposes. These grants range from $500 to $800. Match is not required, but you can use it to match like the SHPO grants or uh, other federal grants. And then we also have a microloan program. Um, that can be used for acquisition purposes. It can be used for planning. It can be used for gap funding. So again, we'll send some links out in the chats or in email so that you can, um, you know, have that information handy. So um, I had one final thought. Historic preservation is not about cities being the museums of yesterday. Historic preservation is about using heritage resources to build quality of life for tomorrow. So thank you for joining me. Um, I will turn it over to Susan Pierce now. All right, well, it's great to be here this afternoon. I wanna thank Kelsey and Danielle and Mike for including me in this activity and I am going to spend um, some time talking about the tax credit program. I'm going to review the application process to try and dispel some of the nervousness associated with it. And um, also talk about the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation so that you get an idea of um, the types of um, restrictions, that's not a great word for it, but how to work within those standards in order to uh, receive the tax credits. So next slide, please. So there are federal tax credits and these create jobs and actually are one of the most successful and cost-effective community revitalization programs. And I really appreciated how Danielle discussed, uh, shared the statistics um, that those were interesting and actually support the whole idea that tax incentives can make a difference in your community. And I've included um, some additional uh, statistics. The tax credits have leveraged the historic tax credits, just those have 
leveraged over $102 billion in private investment to preserve over 45,000 historic properties since 1976. And a little later on, I'll share with you um, a statistic from the last five years here in West Virginia. But the tax credit is equal to 20%. And um, several years ago, the way that was administered was changed by uh, the feds. You now take 4% each year over a period of five years, four times five is 20. So you get 20% over five years. Next slide, please. So it's a 20% income tax credit. And Danielle mentioned earlier um, that those tax credits are available to a certified historic structure. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is. You also need to comply with the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. And you have to expend either $5,000 the greater of $5,000 or the adjusted basis in the building. Um, and we, the Park Service gives a little formula on their website that um, shares how to calculate your adjusted basis. And the Internal Revenue Service has decided what rehabilitation expenses qualify for the credit. And you'll see language, people will throw out QRE and that's qualified rehab expenses. Next slide, please. We have a list of the QREs on our website and it's also available on the National Park Service website. In West Virginia, we have a state credit and right now that credit is equal to 25% of the investment in the building. That 25% is an increase from what it was. I believe we had it at 10% five years ago. Um, we had a great group of people that um, requested and uh, educated our state legislature on how important this credit was and had a 25% in, had the tax credit increase to 25%. Right now, that credit is under review in the state legislature to eliminate the sunset, to eliminate the sunset and eliminate a cap on individual investment costs. You can see also on the slide how much we've had in qualified rehab expenses just in the last six years, over $48 million. And that gets calculated into about $16 million in tax credits just in the last six years in West Virginia. Next slide, please. So Danielle mentioned already, we also have a residential rehab credit and that process takes the same path that the commercial credit takes. To qualify though, the owner must complete a material rehabilitation of more than 20% of the assessed value, not the adjusted basis, but the assessed value of the building, which does not include the value of the land. And that's fairly easy to calculate. You have access to your tax records and you can look up the assessed value. It's not that hard to reach that. And um, again, it's the credit is based upon rehab expenses that are qualified under the Internal Revenue Service. Next slide. We are going to go through the process. There are three parts to the application and two copies are sent to our office. One stays with us and one goes to the National Park Service. The process starts with us. We provide recommendations. We do not approve the project. That is the National Park Service responsibility. They are planning to transition to electronic submission. It was already in the works before the pandemic, but they are moving to um, electronic submissions to reduce paper. They've also recently required and will turn back any application that is not using the revised 2019 application form. If you're not sure which form that is, it has REV.2019 up in the left-hand corner. Any application of the three parts need to have clear and descriptive photographs and the application forms are found on the National Park Service website. So we're going to go quickly through the three parts of the application, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Part one is the evaluation of significance. This part 
of the application is not required if the building is listed individually. It is required for buildings within the historic district and it is also required if the building has not been determined eligible yet. You have to submit that. If you don't fall within the historic district as a contributing building and you're not individually listed, you do have to get your property listed by the end of the tax credit application process. There is a window in which to complete that, but the part one evaluation application, the National Park Service will certify your building as historic. Next slide. Part two of the, it goes into greater detail about the current condition of the essential features of the building. And I am using photographs that I took from a current application. This is Kobe Hall in Montgomery and Fayette County. And this um, classroom building is being adapted into housing. And so the description of rehabilitation included lots of photographs of the existing features of the building, the current conditions. It also included architectural drawings. Um, sometimes we get material samples of what is proposed to be used and um, other information that helps us understand what is going to change in the building and what is going to stay the same historic appearance. That, this part, the part two, should be sent in before work starts. You don't want to get too far into the project and find that what you thought met the standards actually doesn't because you will have to remediate what you did in order to get the tax credit. Generally people do not do that on occasion though it has caused some problems. So at the point where the part two is approved work begins on the project and when work Actually, if you don't mind going to the next slide, there's another slide about part two. You want to submit prior to reconstruction. Um, I get questions a lot about when the rehab expenses uh, need to be incurred. You have a 24 month period to complete the project and it ends, that 24 month period ends on December 31st of the year that you plan on starting your tax credit. You can amend your application and we have had that in the past where um, specific issues in the rehabilitation project have been pulled out and looked at separately to make sure that it's being done correctly. You can also tick a box on the application to give you more time. A project can occur in phases within a 60 month time frame, but you have to decide that at the beginning of the process. You can't decide halfway through the process that, oh, this is going to take longer than two years. I really want to do the six months. You have to decide that up front. There are fees from the National Park Service, and there's a fee at the SHPO level to take the state piggyback credit on the commercial credit. Um, so you have to pay those in order to get your Part 2 um, approved by the National Park Service and by our office. And again, this is another um, photograph of a postcard or a rendering from Kobe Hall when it was the science building at Tech. Um, and that came in our application to show what the appearance of the building was historically or what was proposed. Um, so after you get through the part two approval and you start your project and you finish up the project on the next slide, is an example of a project, and you can go to that. This project just finished in um, Charleston. This is the Atlas building on Courier Street, and they just finished adapting this building into housing, apartments, loft apartments. Um, I selected this photograph um, because it was a better picture of the building, but if you looked on the right side of the building, you would see their advertisement that they are now renting it out as apartments and lofts. All you need for the part three is a complete set of photographs documenting the rehab of the building. And actually those photos need to relate back to the photos in the part two so that the park service in my office can see, you know, what changed, what was improved, what was repaired from the beginning of your project to the end of your project. That very quickly 
is the three parts of the application. Um, primarily, there's a cover page to it that you fill out, and then the rest of the application um, in the part two is the current condition and what you propose to do in the project. And then the part three um, documents what you have completed. Now, the next slide shows um, an important form that we've gotten questions about recently. People are making this a little harder than um, what it really is, but the tax credits can be transferred, uh, the West Virginia credits. And so this is, this is the form. You fill it out and you identify who is transferring the credit and who is getting a transfer of the credit. Um, and then you submit that form to our office. We sign it and you keep it in your records. We don't keep the original, you get it and you use it in your tax returns. So that in a nutshell is the tax credit program. The next slide mentions some additional programs that we have here at the State Historic Preservation Office. We have a federal grant program for survey and planning activities. And these have been used in the past for pre-development projects such as a historic structures report or architectural plans to help in the initial stages of the rehabilitation of a building. We also have an annual matching development grant fund that's available through our West Virginia legislature. And the deadline is March 31st. Um, that's less than a week away, but if you have a project that you're interested in doing, I strongly encourage you, you can put that application together in a week's time. We are very gracious in um, accepting applications that have um, been done at short notice. And then the last um, program that we assist with um, are easements. I think uh, PAWV has also helped with easements in the past as well. Um, but those can also protect historic resources through his charitable deduction. Okay, well, we're gonna turn really quickly to um, what the standards for rehabilitation are about. Um, and they were created to provide guidance on long-term preservation of a property's significant features and materials. And there are common rehab concerns um, regarding the windows, the interior characteristics, uh, placing new additions on the building, and how to deal with new technology and materials that we can use um, today that were not available in the past. Um, next slide, and I am going to go quickly through this. Um, this is an example of an older tax credit that met the standards. This is the first, I'm not gonna get the full name of it. It's the first school in Elkins. I think I'm missing a, a word out of that, but it was one of our good success stories um, that used several different tax incentives. First Ward School, thank you very much, Madeline. Um, I knew I was missing a term in there, but that it was used as a book depository. Obviously you don't need the roller in the middle of your hallway anymore when you're converting it to apartments. So out it went and the building was refinished, repainted, the classrooms were changed into um, apartments. Next slide. So the standards looks at materials and the stabilization. Um, a lot of buildings in West Virginia are brick. And so mortar and the repointing of brick often is an activity that comes into play in the rehabilitation of your building. And we strongly encourage using the National Park Service's technical briefs to help with um, understanding what occurs to repoint brick. Um, and matching up the masonry mix, the mortar mix that's used for um, bricks. The next slide shows that the standards also looks at the size, the shape and form of a building. Um, Fort Pleasant outside um, Moorfield in Old Fields, the side of the building collapsed. They took advantage of the residential tax credit as well as our development grant to restabilize that building. But the shape of the building and its size and form is also an important part of the building. Going back in the next slide to First Ward School, 
the circulation patterns in a building are all significant. And so they maintained the exterior hallways shown in the left, but inside the classrooms, they divided up the space to provide privacy from living space, bathroom, and um, bedroom space within the classroom. Next slide. Doorways are also an important part um, of, of a building and often dealing with the fire marshal becomes um, a critical issue in dealing with transoms above windows. Um, within the interior of buildings, transom lights were often used to provide additional sunlight into the building and those become a fire hazard. And so working with the fire marshal on those issues is an important part of your project. Windows, next slide. The National Park Service and our office recommends that you maintain the existing windows. They can be rehabilitated and um, restored. Um, storm windows can help with the energy efficiency. Um, this is an example of a project that received grant funds to um, rehabilitate the existing window and to provide storm windows. And then structural systems. Um, looking at, at this particular building, at one point it was being considered to um, alter the, the system of the rafters and the other supports in this attic in order to provide additional um, living space. I'm not sure if this project ever reached completion, but this was an earlier project that I looked at with Mike. And as you will see, the color of my hair has changed dramatically since this project. An oldie but a goodie. We talked earlier about pre-development evaluation of structural conditions. Um, this is a development grant project that we uh, under, have undertaken with, um, good to know, Mike, that it was completed. But here at the Blue Sulphur Spring Pavilion, they are dealing with a lot of structural issues um, and actual conditions um, in the grounds. The, there's a water source. Obviously, it's a spring. The water source is impacting the condition of those columns. And so we have provided assistance. It's always good to figure out things ahead of time before you try to fix the building. And that's part of the standards as well. They recommend that you evaluate your building before you get into it. Next slide. And then obviously the setting of a building can make an incredible difference to your property. Uh, this is Elmwood, again, down in Union in Monroe County. Um, and as you can tell, it's not just the building that's historic. The view from the building, uh, the outbuildings for the property, as well as um, its association with the rest of the community. And that's something to take into consideration. Next slide. Roof, gutters, and chimneys are also um, a big part of your rehabilitation project. Next slide. As well as the interior and addressing plaster. Um, the National Park Service in our office recommends repair to plaster. Um, replacing it with wallboard is not something uh, to consider unless the condition of the plaster is severely deteriorated. And in this case, in this corner, it has experienced an incredible amount of water damage. And then the next slide shows that you deal with existing changes to the building. This was an additional bathroom that was added to Elmwood. And then there are also other issues to consider in the next slide. Um, energy efficiency, which um, becomes part of looking at the windows, accessibility, life and safety, and building codes all play a part in the rehabilitation of a historic building. Next slide, please. And then just to show that big and small projects can take part in these, um, in the historic rehabilitation tax credits. On the right is Hotel Morgan, which just um, had a ribbon cutting ceremony yesterday, I believe. The governor was in, expected to attend that as well as other officials from the state. And then on the left, 
is the carriage house at the Coons Mansion in Clendenin, which is a very small, so to speak, uh, residential tax credit project, but they rehabilitated um, the eaves on the carriage house. And um, so the residential program isn't just for the big massive rehabilitation projects of multi-million dollar investment, but also investments can occur um, through uh, individual property owners that want to protect their historic resources. And then finally, the last slide of my presentation gives our website where this information can be found and links to the National Park Service can be found on our website. There's our address, there's our phone number, and there is our ubiquitous EEO blurb that we need to use because we receive funding from the National Park Service. Danielle is very familiar with it, as is a lot of our grant applications because it goes everywhere with you. So I thank you for listening. I tried to talk quickly um, because of time. So thank you very much and I hope that you contact us. And I will take share the slides now to Mike. Hand it over to Mike Giolis. All right, what, what's our timing, Kelsey? have as much time as you all need. So as long as you all want to be here with me, I'm happy to stay. <laughs> oh, okay. Because I, I could quickly go through it, but I'll, all right. Next. Take your time, Mike. Yeah, next slide. All right. So what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show one project start to finish, which will illustrate a lot of the discussion that uh, Danielle and Susan had, uh, and it'll illustrate the predominantly the tax credit issue uh, application, but also there were a number of other funding sources and partners in the project. And as you all know, um, a project uh, generally cannot occur without a number of partners and a number of participants. Uh, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll note the ones that I will talk about later on, and that is the uh, property owners who are the Bullock Properties, uh, and then the tenants, because you can't, in a commercial project, you can't have a project that's successful unless you have tenants later on. Uh, all the other partners that are on this list here, I will uh, mention as we go along. Next. So this is the building in question, 222 West Washington Street. And you're all gonna say, which is what I said when I first saw it, that's not a historic building. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the way it appeared at the time that we looked at it, uh, we were pretty sure it was not a historic building. Next. Uh, in fact, uh, we had done the National Register nomination for the Elk City Historic District in Charleston and had identified that building as a non-contributing building, which is Danielle mentioned that earlier on, um, because based on its appearance, and you can go to the next slide, uh, it looked like it was a 1970s big box store. It had the uh, uh, aluminum, uh, fascia, aluminum windows, entrance door, modern brick. It had the yellow and red and black uh, signage on the exterior and on the interior. It looked like any Dollar General you'd see anywhere in the country. Uh, all modern materials. Next. In fact, Cura, when the building became vacant, uh, Cura, which is Charleston Urban Renewal Authority, uh, had decided that they would like to see the building demolished and a new building built in its place. And this, they had, uh, they commissioned an artist rendering of what could happen in that corner. And this is what they thought might be an uh, option. Next. But now we enter the Bullock properties, uh, John and Ty Bullock, uh, and the Natural Capital Investment Fund. The Bullocks had invested a lot of money in the neighborhood in a number of other buildings, and they thought they would like to see something happen at that building across the street from their offices. Uh, they worked with the Natural Capital Investment Fund, which provided uh, assistance on the purchase of the building and the rehab of the building. Next. After purchasing it, 
they started some selective demolition. Uh, and while they were demolishing it, they found more and more material that looked like it might be old. Uh, if you look the photograph on the right, uh, you can see that little circular thing. This is the rear wall of the building, the original portion of the building. And when I looked at it, I was trying to figure out what that circular uh, brickwork was. And then on the lower left, you could see that there is uh, the remains of a historic terrazzo floor underneath that vinyl tile that was uh, installed by the Dollar General. Next. And other elements of the building became, uh, came to light as more and more of the modern accoutrements were removed. Uh, you could see the pressed metal ceiling. You could see the openings in the wall on the right photograph of the rear wall, which were predominantly original openings. And we even found one historic, maybe not original, but historic window, uh, which we ended up retaining throughout the entire project. Next. So based on this found information, um, the bullets then approached the Charleston Main Street uh, and the West Virginia Main Street program and requested design assistance to develop a schematic uh, rendering of what the building could look like if it were rehabilitated. Uh, at the time the rendering was done, we had what was uncovered in initially, and we also had these two uh, very grainy uh, aerial photographs. These are zoomed in on an aerial photograph, so we can't see details, but we could see the concept that it was four storefronts originally, and the storefront seemed to have some, some form of a step parapet. Next. So based on that information, we developed a couple of uh, alternative renderings to show what possibly could happen and how the building could fit into the Elk City Historic District. Uh, and this is one of those renderings. It was provided by Main Street uh, through my, my services provided through Main Street. And this went back to the original concept of four storefronts. Next. So based on this idea, we now have BB&T and Charleston Area Alliance entering the game. Uh, they, the Bullocks requested a uh, community grant uh, from BB&T, which was funneled through Charleston Area Alliance's nonprofit organization, CADCO Foundation, to assist in uh, conducting more research, uh, more development, and attempt and preparing a part one application, which would turn the decision from non-contributing to contributing. Uh, and so they were successful in securing those funds. And the next slide. Uh, we conducted more research, including historic uh, map research. These are Sanborn maps, which were used by insurance companies to set their rates. And you could see the building in the 1907 on the lower left, the building is not there. It's a different configuration of other buildings. In 1912, the building is there as four storefronts. 1933, lower right, the building is there again as four storefronts with a drugstore on the corner. And then in 1950, the building is still there, drugstore is still on the corner, but the two right storefronts were combined into one supermarket. Next. And then the uh, city directories confirmed our research on the maps. If you look there at the, the one I've highlighted uh, is the Alpha R. Johnson pharmacist. And that's who occupied that left side pharmacy uh, bay. Next, and remember that name, it'll come up again later. So as, as we proceeded with the documentary research. We also proceeded with the physical research and we uncovered more and more of the building as more of the 1970s stuff was removed. You could see in the right photograph the original blonde brick that was used as a decorative brick on the front face of the building and at the top between that piece of steel and the brick is what's left of a piece of limestone that was used as an accent panel in the brick facade. 
On the left photograph, you could see we've uncovered the transom window area. There are no windows there, of course, but at least now we know what the size and shape of the transom windows were. And again, you could see the pressed metal ceiling. But what's interesting is there's even another finished ceiling beneath the pressed metal. Next. And here we are. That steel piece was the beam that supported the entire parapet wall above the storefront area. And if you look closely, you could see RJOH. And so that is the AR Johnson drugs was what that beam was spelling out. It was used as a signboard. And so the physical evidence confirmed our research evidence. Next. And then one really neat find, even though it's severely deteriorated, uh, as you turned around the corner, we were able to determine what the pilaster configuration was. That's the left side of the chewed up brick. You could see that there was a, a, a border of bricks that are called headers, they face out, uh, that uh, bordered an interior uh, face of bricks as well. And so that was the configuration we determined was appropriate. There's another building nearby that had the same configuration, and so we designed that. Um, so the things we found during the demolition were well, the terrazzo flooring, the metal ceilings, the dividing walls uh, in the attic, the openings on the rear wall, the beam, which was used as a sign, the blonde brick, and then the side elevation. Next. So, now we had the part one, it got approved, and we are going into the design phase and the part two application. So we, uh, we consulted the National Park Service's websites and the materials that, that they provide in addition to the standards. They have the preservation briefs. And in fact, they also have a specific brochure on Main Street commercial buildings. Next. They also have what's called interpreting the standards. And this is what we use to figure out how they would approach constructing a new storefront when one does not exist. Next. And so the result is a refinement of the initial rendering uh, along with how we were gonna configure each of the storefronts for the entrances. And you can see we retained the step parapet, but now we were able to add in the beam uh, and signage above the, above the transom window. We had the size and shape of the transom window, and then we had the stone accents in the pilasters. Next. And then here's more detail about that. Uh, and then all of these storefronts followed the Preservation brief number 11, which is on historic storefronts. We retain the kick panel, which is the area beneath the display windows of an appropriate height. We had a framing around the storefront itself. We had transom windows, we had display windows, and we had signage. Next. Oh, and again, also we had storefronts in a downtown generally reflect about a 25 to 30 foot pattern, a rhythm of as you're walking down the street, you hit a storefront every 25 or 30 feet. And so that, that makes the downtown walkable. It makes it a pedestrian scale. So the plans called for the two storefronts, uh, which would have been on the left of those drawings that you had seen previously, the maps, uh, to be combined into one uh, restaurant. Next. And then the other two storefronts, a portion of the middle one was going to be used for doctor's offices. Uh, and then the remain, the last one on the right side of the building uh, was used. The storefront was the entrance into a theater on the rear of the building. And all of these configurations retain the basic storefront uh, massing, the, the volume and the uh, 20, about the 20, 20 foot, I think it was actually 22 feet width, uh, as well as a recessed entrance, which doesn't show on the doctor's office, but that, but it's there. Next. We also had during construction, obviously we had to determine what type of brick to use. And so we 
re we researched and investigated and you don't know how many bricks we looked at, but we finally settled on a brick that was as close as we can get to the color of the brick and then as close as we can get to the color of the mortar. Uh, and you could see that there are remaining pieces of mortar on that old brick that we were able to take out of the wall. Next. And during construction, these are the two smaller storefronts, not the restaurant. And you could see that the intent was to leave the tall ceilings, uh, restore the pressed metal ceiling. And then when we had to introduce either a, a ticket office or a storage room or the uh, reception area, it was kept low so that you could see over the top of it and see the entire depth of the storefront. Next. So this is the finished product. Uh, it did come out pretty good. Of course, there are some changes from what we drew because things happen during construction. Next. Another view. Next. The, we kept that, that return on the side street, uh, which also had a transom window and a display window. And then the restaurant uses the side street uh, as outdoor dining. There's a re you could see the door on the left side, the rear of the building where you can come out to the outdoor dining. Next. This is the completed interior of the storefront, I mean of the restaurant. And again, you could see all the elements that we retained. Next. Uh, here we see the terrazzo floor. It doesn't look brand new, it doesn't look beautiful, but it is a piece of history and it's got some character to it. It was retained. And then there was some graffiti found during construction. So the owners put a frame around that and some glass so that people could look at what people were doing while they were building things in the past. Next. And then these are, this is the doctor's office is on the left. You could see his reception area and his file room which is uh, kept away from the ceiling of the original storefront. And then on the right is the storage room and a lounge area for the theater, uh, which overlooks the entrance. Next. And then this is the house uh, of the theater, uh, standing on the stage and looking at it. Uh, and then the one on the upper left uh, is looking down the full length of the storefront from the theater. And again, you could see the white, uh, which is the entrance and the press metal ceiling in that location. Next. And that's it. Uh, we did, we were successful in securing our part three approval. Uh, we did hit a number of snags on the building. This was a complicated project a little bit more complicated than normal, but we do have, I mean, any project has complications. Uh, and I'd be willing to discuss it with anybody uh, if you want to call or email. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you guys so very much. <laughs> I'm always very excited when I get to hear about some good preservation projects. So this has been great. Um, I know we went a little bit uh, longer than we originally expected, but are all three of you still okay to answer some questions? Excellent. Okay. I have not even been able to look at the chat this whole time, so let me scroll back through here and see what we've got. Also, a reminder, go ahead and throw some questions in the chat, everyone, if you've got them. I know there's some in here already, but if there's anything else uh, anyone else wants to add, go on ahead and throw it in there. So I'm scrolling back through here. I see a lot of folks uh, from Elkins. I'm in Elkins, so hey, everybody. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I've got a question from Lauren Kemp. Uh, how are the new market credits determined? Um, it looks like Danielle answered that. Uh, so, and I'll send I'll send some of these answers around as well when I send the follow up materials. So. Um, We'll have a little things. bit to the answer. Is yeah, I was hoping that, yeah, you could add on a little. Yeah, yeah. and please take it away. Go on ahead and I will let you say that because you can explain it better than I can. <laughs> yeah. the, the new market tax credits are a really complicated uh, process. 
they are predicated on expenditure of funds, not on the building. It doesn't require a historic building or anything. It requires an investment in a certified development entity, which is investing in one of those distressed tracks that uh, Danielle showed. Um, the tax credit for someone who invests in one of those CDEs is 39% of their investment spread over a seven year period. Um, the amount per year changes is very strange. I think it's 15% the first year and then 7% the, for the next four, uh, four um, six years, I'm sorry. Um, but it's a complicated situation uh, and it requires the investor to be involved in the project for the seven years, uh, it's a seven year holding period. And each of those seven years, uh, a financial audit is required. And if anything is amiss during any of those seven years, the entire uh, credit is recaptured. So it's a, uh, a lot of investors are afraid to invest in new market tax credits because of things like that. Uh, it is run by the, uh, the Treasury, not by the Park Service and not by the IRS. Excellent. Susan or Danielle, anything to add to that? All right. Um, let's see, we've got one nice comment from Lynn Cutter. Thanks, Susan. Working with SHPO helps the community appreciate its historic buildings. So thank you, Lynn, for that. Let's see. Um, someone's asking the rough timelines and turnarounds on parts one and two of historic tax credit applications. Um, for example, for an average two-story home or a Main Street commercial building, what's kind of the rough time frame for that? The turnaround for both of those is, um, we have 30 days to send them up to the park service and then the park service has 30 days as well. Um, and currently that is uh, on target. The park service got a little bit behind during COVID, um, but they, uh, we currently our reviewer is uh, on top of things. The part two, the turnaround um, that depends upon the building. Um, you're saying for an average two-story home or Main Street commercial building, um, those are pretty straightforward. So I would say that um, if you have worked with our office to uh, make sure that your proposed rehabilitation of the Main Street building uh, meets the standards, it would not be problematic. Um, and then for a residential home, um, it again, it depends upon what you're trying to do. We would have to, generally the focus on residential credits are the windows and um, replacing versus repair them. Um, that can be something that has to be worked out. On a Main Street commercial building, the main issue is uh, the, existing character of the storefront and what the proposal is um, in terms of meeting the appropriateness of the proposed changes. If you have historic documentation, um, that's really important. Um, Mike's example um, is rather a unique example of what you find in a building, but it's really helpful for a commercial building to have photographs of the storefront because those will give you clues as to what is appropriate um, to, to follow. Um, and actually Mike's example also speaks a lot to the fact that you have information to use from the building. Um, generally you find the remnants or the ghosts of what it looked like before and you can use those so that you um, can renovate the building, rehabilitate the building in an appropriate manner. If you don't have that, what you do is you look at existing historic examples within the commercial area in the Main Street area to uh, 
to reflect the character, the overall character of the area. Um, and you can work with the Main Street staff. Jennifer Brennan popped on here late, I saw. So you can work with her and Mike Jolis to help you get through that process of understanding what your building is like. And of course, our office is available also. Um, so I hope that answers Chris's um, question. Yeah, excellent, thank you. And while we're talking about Main Street a little bit, I wrote down a stat that I saw earlier. I was reading some articles uh, for this, and it said that for every $1 spent on a Main Street program, it'll yield $40 in economic reinvestment in return, which is absolutely incredible. So um, if anyone is not actively working with their um, Main Street community, or if you want to become a Main Street community, uh, Mike, can you maybe tell us how to, how, is there an application process to join Main Street, or who should you contact? Uh, I'll let uh, I'll let Jennifer answer that. Oh, can you unmute her? Uh, that... Let me find her. <laughs> yes, I can. There we go. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Um, so thanks, Mike. <laughs> um, you could totally have answered this question. Um, there is an application process. Um, the first step in becoming a Main Street in West Virginia is actually to become what we call um, an on-track community, which is um, a two-year program where you kind of, um, you learn the expectations of what a Main Street community is, and we also learn um, what the capacity of your community is. So it's kind of a getting to know you building capacity time frame that lasts about two years. After those two years are up, you can then apply to become a Main Street um, community. And there is a review process and we, put together a, um, a group of professionals who comes and, and does a visit and spends about two days roughly um, with, within the community learning, meeting all of the, um, all the people who would be involved. Main Street really is um, not just kind of a one group. Our expectation is that you would have uh, interaction with your city government and maybe some other community organizations within your town. So we kind of look at all of that. I would also say you don't necessarily, if you're an on-track community, you don't have to become a Main Street. If you don't feel as though your capacity is there, you can stay at an on-track level and you still receive similar services to what a Main Street would do. So um, we, we've had some communities that have just decided to stay on track because one of the qualifications of becoming a Main Street that you do have to have a paid staff um, and some communities just don't have that and that's fine. Um, we still work with you and you can maintain your on track status indefinitely. So um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions specific to your community. Excellent. Thank you. I'll probably throw your contact information in with with my contacts and the follow-up, so. <laughs> and also, uh, shameless plug for the Brownfields Assistance Center and Main Street, um, we're having the West Virginia Brownfields Conference coming up in September, and there will be a Main Street on track uh, portion of that that is in the conference. So if you wanna learn more about Main Street or how, again, this whole thing overlaps, the title today is Historic Preservation, a Tool for Brownfields. So if you want to learn more about this, uh, you know, intersection between the two, uh, go ahead and uh, follow, follow the updates on our website for the uh, Brownfields Conference coming up. And I know, um, you know, again, there's probably still a lot of uh, confusion around what Brownfields are. A lot of times people, like Danielle started out mentioning in the beginning, people just are not aware of what they are. And it's because they're so varied. It can be just about anything. A lot of, uh, there's a few uh, people that uh, I've been working with that say that if man has been there, it's probably a brownfield. <laughs> so that's a, it's a good way to kind of think about if there's been an impact somehow and it could be negative, there's a good chance that building can be a brownfield. So if you are interested in pursuing um, brownfields related assistance or grants, you can also reach out to our office, the Northern West Virginia Brownfields Assistance Center. I don't see any other questions down here in the chat. So there's uh, 
another one that I had uh, that I wanted to go ahead and ask. Um, so a big concern with public buildings, if you're going to do something commercial, is obviously accessibility and making things accessible to the public. So can anyone give me just a little bit of clarification about what the expectations are for making a historic building um, ADA compliant versus, you know, protecting the historic fabric? Like, where is that line kind of fall in the sand? It actually, it depends upon each building. You have to look at the actual building and um, what constraints you have. Um, the Park Service generally wants you to preserve the um, front facade of the building, but you also under ADA have to provide equal um, facilities. You can't just regulate someone um, who falls under ADA to go to the back of the building. Um, so you really need to um, assess the building um, and blend into the character of the building using the same types of materials. Um, actually, we just had a project here on campus. Um, Jennifer may not be aware of it. Um, she worked on it um, building one of our buildings. I think it's building four. They uh, wanted to put an elevator on it to help, not an elevator, a side stairwell to provide access. Um, and that was abandoned. And they came up with a much simpler solution to provide ADA access to the building. So it really, um, to answer your question, you need to look at the existing building and how you can um, complement the character of that building and blend your ramp or your lift to provide access um, to everyone into the building and be creative. Um, I don't know if Mike's had any, um, if Mike has some good examples to share with that as well. The, the, pre, the uh, Park Service has a preservation brief on that, uh, on accessibility. And there are the National Trust and the Park Service do have uh, sections on their websites about it. Generally, yeah, I, Susan said it all basically is you look at the building individually and try to fit whatever you're doing into the building. Be as unobtrusive as possible, but still you need to make it obvious to somebody who needs to use that access that it is there. Uh, a good example is the, uh, the ramp that goes into the Capitol building that's in front of the Culture Center. Um, that's kind of, they just ramped the grade of the lawn to go up. And so it's not really a very obvious or very intrusive ramp into the building. There's a church in Huntington, I always look at that has done a similar thing and it's, in re and it's a really good example. Um, uh, a lot of times you just need to sometimes make some compromise, but just make sure that you don't damage any really significant uh, historic fabric or character of the building. Okay, good to know. And the same, the same, that question still also kind of applies for like co-compliance, like you were mentioning, you know, earlier. So it's these sort of technical things that also wind up making everything kind of confusing and having to learn to navigate. So it can be done. The main, the main point of that question was to make everyone realize it's nothing to be afraid of. It can be done. Uh, you just might have to get creative. So thank you for that. <laughs> Kelsey, I would point out in terms of working with your fire marshal that you should work with him or her in order to deal with the issues of meeting code and complying with code. Um, yesterday, I was talking to John, our National Park Service reviewer, about a project, and he had issues with certain parts of the um, project, but he said, you know, they got everything else right and he was impressed that they had managed to maintain the transoms above the windows and he's like how did they manage to do that and that to him was like the highlight of the building that they had managed to work with um, their fire marshal to get that 
variance, I guess, in order to keep that. So the little things that they kind of messed up on, he was like, I'm not going to ding him for that. They clearly got the big picture. Um, and so he was very impressed at that, that that happened. So what I would, I would encourage just continue to work and educate the code compliant, the code officials in your communities to try and help them understand um, what, what's important and what maintains the character of your building. Yeah, I'll reiterate, he, he must have been impressed because he mentioned it to me yesterday too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I was he talking. Mentioned to, he was talking. He had talked to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He. Uh, uh, I was talking to him about a code issue also, uh, and in this case, the fire marshal in Charleston asked me my opinion on something before he made a decision. So. Wow. Um, they are approachable. You just need to work <laughs> with them. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> It also makes me happy because I, I am a sucker for a good transom. So I, I as many as we can keep, that is good, good for me. So <laughs> um, I see someone asked uh, about how to register for the Brownfields Conference that I was just mentioning. Um, yeah, we're still, we're still working on setting it up is, is why it's not really an active registration right now. Um, currently, we're in the call for sessions phase. So if anyone here is someone who works in redevelopment or historic preservation or any of these fields and you've got something that you think would make a good presentation for that conference, um, you can go to our website, uh, which Jennifer shared the link. Thank you. Um, you can go, there's a call for sessions page there uh, and you can submit that. So you can't register just yet, um, but you can get in at the ground level and you can be a presenter yourself if you would like. So uh, that deadline is April 12th. We are, we are going to visit Huntington. Thank you, Lauren. It is tentatively scheduled for Huntington. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's hopefully, as long as things stay as at the level they are now, conditions wise, uh, we will be in person in Huntington. So um, let me think. Speaking of conference, there's the PAWB conference. Danielle wanted to uh, plug that as well. I don't know, are we still accepting applications for presenters for that one? Yes, tomorrow is actually the deadline, but if you have an idea and you don't have a chance to get it together for tomorrow, just send me an email and we can talk and that um, I can put that information in the chat and yeah we're putting together. Um, we're going to do things over a period of like the spring and summer, where we do some hands on technical workshops um, on historic properties or cemeteries, we have different ideas um, that will be outdoors in person, following the social distancing guidelines. Um, and then we're going to do some virtual lecture series similar to this kind of concept. So yeah, if you have ideas, I'll put the information in the chat and then we'll hopefully we can send out information when we get the schedule together. Perfect. Okay. Well, we have been here for 90 minutes now. We have had so much good conversation. I'm so grateful that you all hung in with us. Um, I know that uh, the main thing that I wanted to clear up today was that kind of myth that if you buy a historic house and you don't paint it the right color that the National Register folks are going to come and arrest you on the spot and that's <laughs> I wanted to kind of clear that up today uh, and I think we've done that and more. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Susan and Mike and Danielle for giving us all this great information and for doing all the work that you do in the field. Um, thanks on behalf of, of everyone that gets to enjoy uh, the fruits of that labor. So um, we're going to have our next session next month. Uh, as always, it'll be the last Thursday of the month at one o'clock. It's going to be called The Power of Parcel Data, uh, given by Nicole Diaz, the Bad Buildings Project Associate, uh, who you met in the first session. So sign up for that if you have not yet already. And uh, I will follow up with everybody with all of the links and slides and good questions and all of that that we talked about here today. So thank you all again very much uh, and we will see you next month. <laughs> Bye everybody. <laughs>